All right, back on LinkedIn with Scott Fike, my buddy. All right, so we've talked about trans how you transitioned and your transition story, uh, but you didn't just stop at one company. You transitioned to a couple of different companies. You've become a much uh, more succinct leader, perhaps. Tell us a little bit about that, about how do you translate your leadership skills in law enforcement to make them relevant for folks in the private sector and corporate security? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, look, anyone who's worked a day in law enforcement, you understand that every day is different. You must remain flexible and nimble. Uh, you must have analytical skills. You must have uh, skills around self-motivation and frankly, motivating others because in law enforcement, sometimes things can be a little quiet. So it's just trying to determine, you know, how I take those things that I learned and then apply them. Some people don't even realize that they have these kind of hard skills. And so for me, um, I started to realize pretty quickly when I landed at NVIDIA with you and Wes that um, a lot of things that we do in the corporate world within a program are influenced by each other. For instance, physical security encompasses a whole bunch of things. And for one thing to work well, you need a lot of other things to be operating. So to do investigations well, you need intelligence. To be able to do intelligence, you have to have data. To have data, you need a tech stack. And so for me, it was just trying to figure out how I get all this stuff. And I recall, you know, I'm thinking back like, well, that kind of looks like when you're in a police car and the radio's going off and you're responding to an accident and then you have shots fired, different reports, different response, different equipment. So it's really trying to remain flexible and nimble and then never losing um, control. We need to show up in a measured way, um, not show uh, stress under pressure. Uh, fake it till you make it sometimes. I remember when I landed at EA, I would literally be driving home on the 101 and cold sweat would be running down my arms because I was the whole global security program on day one. I mean, literally it was me alone globally uh, for a, a large gaming company. And so, so, but what I did was I reverted back to the, to the skills that I developed in law enforcement, which is literally, you, you, you just don't know what you're gonna get, so remain flexible and nimble. Um, crisis management requires, requires us to, to employ um, uh, hard and soft skills, you know, uh, muscle memory, you know, well, how did I do this and react? I may not have the answers, uh, the right answers all the time, but I know how to kind of get them quickly if I need to, and so operating under pressure. And so all these things um, play a part in successfully leading and managing, or, or even working, frankly. You don't even need to be leading at that point. You could be an individual contributor, but you need to bring in these skills because as part of the team, we function like a machine. And so I feel strongly that if you've operated within law enforcement, you can already tick off half the requirements that you see on a job description. You just may not understand how to retool and communicate that in an interview on your resume or in link on LinkedIn. And, and without telling, uh, you know, kind of what we call war stories, you know, you, I mean, you have some of the best, by the way. <laughs> if, if we ever get together and, and over a beer, that that that's a heck of a heck of a night. But the uh, telling your experience without kind of what I would say maybe the gory details of what you've seen and what we've all done in law enforcement um, and translating that or at least retooling that so that it delivers in an appropriate manner. I think it's something you have, what I encourage people to do is sit down and think about that. Think about if somebody asks you, you know, which is laughable, what's, you know, what's a hard day for you look like or what, what have you failed at lately in law enforcement? And it's like, you know, when we fail, people have died and you've been around things, I've been around things like that. And so that doesn't translate in a great way to the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, but crisis management is interesting, right? And something that specifically with you and I, I remember sitting in our conference room in Building R when we had a, a building in a foreign country that was almost blown off the face of the map. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And yep. in that we had spun up the crisis and you were the chair of the crisis communications team and, and uh, we were handling what to do next. And somebody uh, mentioned, oh, well, the, the office admin can go into the disaster zone and, and verify. Because what we wanted to know, as you recall, 
we had great video of the building uh, as it was kind of being destroyed, and then the cameras went out. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which of course is the power went out. And the, and the response from the the uh, crisis response team was, we're going to send an office admin into the disaster area. But you and I and I will say you had laid some groundwork literally like the week before with a relationship to and you were very adamant we're not sending an admin person to go into the disaster zone and you had engaged a relationship with a security provider to send a guard in and to have the guard go do it and what turned out was for the people at home the reason why I'm, I'm telling this story one I think that's a good example of your leadership style you had prepped beforehand, I have a relationship that wasn't our vendor that w was already contracted nope. with us. And you had, you had literally, just, I think, just started laying that groundwork for some other projects. And you picked up the phone, it's the middle of the night there. I remember you calling these folks and saying, get a guard here, we'll take care of the paperwork on the back end. And um, it turns out that the, they wouldn't let anybody in except for security, police, fire, military. So not only was it super hazardous for her to even get anywhere near the building, but within, I don't know, eight hours, you think, we had a picture of the front of the building from the guy's flip phone, cell phone camera. Uh, and they remain there, yeah. And they remain there. They kept our building safe. They kept our IP safe because, they're, well, fortunately, we didn't have any employees that were, were injured. Um, but so you had a foresight there, I think, or did you? I mean, were you thinking as you were making this relationship, and that's really what the reason why I tell this story, not so much about the, yeah, we had a building that blew up, but you had a relationship that you were able to engage. Did you know, or did you have some sense that I probably need, there's a gap here, and I need to have a relationship? What was it? Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 a, that, I mean that's a great question. And, and, and for those who are watching, um, I started my law enforcement career just prior to September the 11th, and so, um, I got to see in the nation's capital uh, uh, exactly what happens when things aren't prepared, um, when all the training in the world for the wrong thing doesn't help. And so because of the environment that I worked in, you do start to uh, develop a skill of seeing around corners uh, where you can sort of anticipate an outcome and what it would might look like if you're ill prepared. And so, yes, I do recall what you're referring to in Tianjin, China, that's exactly yeah. where, where it happened. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, these are skills that I definitely brought in from the police department is that I remember being handed an AR-15, I had never touched one before and I was handed one and I was told to respond up to uh, near the Capitol, 50 Mass Avenue and watch for any planes coming in. I'm standing oh, there yeah. thinking, okay, well, the, the plane's floor. going like 300 <laughs> miles an hour and I'm not sure if there's even a, a, a round in the chamber of this thing, I've never fired it. And so it just identified a lot of, of, uh, of, of risk and choke points. And even to this day um, in my role and in my private life, I do try and anticipate what certain outcomes could be if this, then that, and that, that those are all skills, absolutely 100% that I brought from law enforcement. And anyone who has spent even five minutes in law enforcement starts to develop that skill because you learn. Um, uh, Washington DC is a beautiful city, but it hasn't always been the the the, uh, the easiest environment. Uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's a city. It's lots of crime. A lot of things happen. And so yeah, I've been exposed to a lot of active shooter incidents, terror incidents, whether it be anthrax planes hitting structures, uh, all those things. I mean, I've had to work in that environment as part of a team. And so coming over to uh, the corporate side, yes, you bring all of those things. You have to soften it a little bit. You can't train people to flip desks and jump under, put gas masks on, and you, that may- a <laughs> story about it. <laughs> yeah, who was the head of security at one point for one of the biggest social media companies. And I think his last week was the week that happened. You know, you can't train like that. All right. But you've got to be able to, again, I say retool um, because the reality is uh, the, a lot of times in corporate security, it's just, it's a, it's a quality issue, quality of life type issue. It's an inconvenience issue. It's not a loss of life issue. And when people get wrapped around the axle in tech, and I did this a couple of times where I'd say, you know, okay, worse, is there a body attached to this problem? <laughs> and people would say, what do you mean? And and I said, well, is, has anyone died? Could anyone die here? And like, well, no. And I'm like, okay, well, then it's really not that big of a problem then, is it? 
I mean, we can solve this. And so again, calling upon uh, cooler minds prevail, coming in, incident manage, try and de-escalate, bring it down to something that's more digestible, um, all things that you bring from law enforcement. Um, yeah, you know, again, as a rookie officer, I didn't have any of those. I mean, I overdrove the car unnecessarily. I, you know, wasn't, you know, wasn't sure how to do certain things and you just, you learn along the way. And so for those that are listening and watching, definitely don't discount those things that you've done in your law enforcement career, because they do translate, whether it's ordering pencils, supply control, it's not exact, but believe me, um, when you think about it very tactically, there's a lot of behavioral uh, learnings that will help, you know, uh, step, step or start your career in the safety and security environment. And then when something really bad does happen, or so we perceive like COVID-19, right. we're able to be calm and cool and help steer millions or billions of dollars of business so that success, the company can su successfully operate in a dynamic environment. And those are all skills that, you know, I know I brought from law enforcement. And I think when we look at, you know, incident response or incident management within a company, uh, you know, this, the security element is a part of that. But um, more often than not, my experience is that the security element will control that. And, and I think that's a good thing. But because of what you're saying, when we see folks with law enforcement military experience that are in those chairs, they, they don't get riled by, hey, we just had a building blow up off the face of the planet or, or worse, we've had, you know, employees become injured or we had employees involved in a coup, you know, um, uh, when they took over a, a country. So uh, th th those things are like, well, that's a Tuesday in our world, not a, not right. a big deal. Um, let's work it. Is there, to your point, are there any body, bodies attached? Um, so that calming sense, I think it does translate well. Uh, what's a skill that you think that people who are coming from law enforcement absolutely need to work on that they may not have the opportunity to do so as a law enforcement officer or, or whatever is there something that you're seeing when as they're they're coming into the private sector that they need to go out into the world and figure out how do you get that skill whatever it is is there something yeah. that comes top of mind great question yes most positions that i'm aware of under normal circumstances in law enforcement you're sort of a one one man or one gal band. You're sort yeah. of doing your thing, unless there's an operation or something, and then you've got key people. So there isn't a lot of collaboration. Um, mm -hmm. In the private sector, you need to learn how to be very collaborative. Um, you, you know, in law enforcement, I may give you a lawful order, and your failure to obey that order would result in your liber liberties being taken from you. You don't have that kind of control or power in the corporate world. In fact, that will get you put in the corner yeah. on time out quickly or terminated, frankly, because a lot of people don't understand what it is you're trying to convey. And if you create panic, fear, um, or unnecessary, you create unnecessary excitement around people because you don't know how to collaborate, you, you force feed people things. Change management is a big part of what we do because we're dealing with things, again, getting ahead of a problem. We're planning for something that may never happen. And a lot of that requires collaborative efforts with our IT partners, legal partners, HR partners, and you don't want to forget to give them credit for how they've managed this stuff before you got there. You might be the expert of what you did before you arrived, but you're no way or near the expert once you arrive in the environment that you have arrived in. Um, so that, that's just my, my thing is that, you know, start understanding what collaboration looks, looks like. Um, I certainly have been accused of not being as collaborative or, or I've been difficult to, to, at times. Um, and I, 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 I take that as a compliment because uh, I can be difficult when the government says you must depopulate, when the government says you must, and then we can do that. We can draw a line and say there's no wiggle room here like COVID. But the reality is most things that we're responsible for are not being handled in a crisis environment. So we do have time. Take the time, be collaborative, invite as many people in as you can so that they start to understand who we are, what we do, and how we do it because that instills trust, confidence, and the long term, that's how you're gonna build an effective partnership is through collaboration. So that would be my collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah, I can't say enough about being cross-functional and, and uh, not being afraid to uh, look s silly by asking questions. You know, like the one of the, we were talking about uh, a, a coworker that we had at NVIDIA, and he was one of the first people that I met at NVIDIA. I had no idea what he did. He explained it to me. I still don't understand it. 
so I asked him a lot of questions and, and tried to, 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 to figure out what he worked on in the finance world. And that's okay. You, you know, you're going to be in situations, you're going to be sometimes forced into situations where you have to be collaborative and you have to be cross-functional. And mm -hmm. um, if that's part of your company's culture, you better adopt that quick or you're going to be on the out. Uh, so yeah. I think that's a great point. And, and Scott, I think to something you just said, and even when it's not the company culture, remember, um, what we're doing is a little bit nuanced. We're not generating revenue for the corporation. We're normally spending a lot of revenue. And so we're not going to have the same leeway or freedom that others who are less collaborative. So I, I, I have to say that there were times where I just would be so frustrated because, you know, my team wasn't being invited in to interview candidates in legal or IT or HR or whatever, but yet I was always welcoming, welcoming the that. folks in to interview our candidates because I wanted everybody to feel like they had a say and understood and could help create something special that we were creating. And, and uh, yeah. Great point. Well, I'll, I'll leave it there. What, what is uh, something that, that you would t say besides collaboration for what's, what, how do you want to close it? What do you want to leave them with? What's that best piece of advice you can give them? My thing is this, um, identify what your passions are, your true passions, and don't be locked into just security. Maybe you've always wanted to be, you know, in uh, basket weaving or auto mechanics, because the reality is if you have a passion for what you're, what's driving you to make a change, you will actually be more successful in that than trying to force something that you're not, you know, if you spent 20 years doing something that you kind of like, but you weren't really in love with it, uh, you, you may not want to spend another 10 or 20 you know, doing kind of the same thing, but in a more, um, you know, uh, it's just, it's a different environment. I mean, it really is. So just really, really identify your passion. And then once you have, dive in and find people like, like yourself, myself, and others who are willing to spend some time with you to help you retool to get you ready. Um, because again, you get one shot and we don't want you to fail. We want you to be successful. So I'm at a point in my career now where I want to start giving back uh, my learnings. So I want to meet people who are not don't have the same skills, who but but yet they're interested in coming in. They want to know, and so I want to start imparting that so that the next generation of security leaders is in the making. You know, make great. it a little easier. Yeah, I I agree. And and what I always say to people is, when you make it or you've made the transition successfully, give back to your partners that are hundred percent coming in the same direction. So. Uh, Scott, it's okay. been great catching up with you. We could do like a two-hour long. <laughs> uh, no, easily. <laughs> and don't, don't, don't get Derek Hernandez and Wes Bull on the same call because then it's just like six hours of, of craziness. So it's great catching up with you. Uh, love hearing what you're working on. And what I'll, again, tell people, uh, don't go it alone. Take care of each other. Share this with your partners. Ask us questions in the comments section below. And keep following us. Uh, ask us or tell us what you want to hear. Maybe there's something we haven't talked about. Uh, it's, but Scott, it's been great catching up with you. And uh, take care. Thanks, I wish you the best, buddy. Thanks. Be well. Take care, Thanks. everyone.